participants. So the presentation will last about 40 minutes with time at the end for questions. So I for one, I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to this, so I won't keep you too long. So we'll just very quickly go over some quick housekeeping. So can everyone just make sure that they're on mute or can the adults in the room just ensure that you're on mute? This is just so we can all listen very carefully to what Podrick is saying. So I do believe there will be time at the end for any questions you guys may have. So if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat box and Podrick might even answer some of these throughout the presentation. So just to mention as well that it will be recorded and available to view over the weekend in case you know anyone who wanted to be here today but couldn't and you want to share with them. So now I'm just going to pass you over to Podrick so we can get started. Hi everybody, I hope you can all uh, see and hear me. Thumbs up if you can. Hey, I think I see my brother there, Sean, mm. in Greystones, and my mother, Eileen, in 17 Latouche Park. How are you doing, guys? Listen, so yeah, my name is Pori Cooley, uh, or you can say Podrick if you want, and that suggests to me that Nicola's origins are from Cork or Kerry or Munster, because no Leinster person would ever say Podrick or Porrick, should I say, Podrick, yeah, sorry. Um, so she said Podrick, so her, her, her parents or grandparents are probably from Cork or Kerry or somewhere. Am I right, Nicola? No. No, okay. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you see, they only say Podrick in Munster. Oh, right. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. In, in Galway and, you know, elsewhere, they typically say Porrick. But uh, anyway, listen, it doesn't matter. I, I'm I'm with the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. And uh, I'm, yeah, thank you very much to uh, As I Am for inviting me here to uh, present to you the work of the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. Uh, and uh, so, listen, without much further ado, we'll, uh, we, we'll just start off. Um, so we've been involved with whales and dolphins now for just over 30 years. We actually had our 30th birthday this year, uh, if you like. So we were established in 1990 and similar to As I Am, we're a charity, uh, although our, our focus is very different. Our focus is, is on the, the study and the research into our cetaceans. And for those of you who don't know, cetaceans are all animals that are either porpoises, which are small, dolphins, which are a little bit bigger, and whales, which are just off the screen. Um, and, and that's what we do. We study and we monitor whales, dolphins, and porpoises in all Irish waters. Uh, and we do this by coordinating two schemes. One is the sighting scheme, which is uh, where members of the public report sightings of living animals out at sea. And the other scheme we have is the not so sort of pleasant side of what we do, but it's the recording of stranded animals. Uh, and they can be very small or they can be very big, such as the fin whale here in Cork McSharry in, in West Cork. And you may wonder, well, you know, why do we record the, these animals, stranded animals? Well, sometimes when they strand, uh, they're actually still alive. Uh, and it's important that we have an opportunity to try and refloat these animals. But in many cases, when dolphins and indeed whales strand, it's because they're sick and it's very unlikely they're going to get back out. Or even if you do get them back out, it's very unlikely that they'll survive in the long term. So, so here's an example of a vet in Larne in County Antrim having to euthanize uh, a, a say whale, which is quite a rare species of whale. Uh, and that's important because we're ending the animal's suffering because a large whale like this that could weigh 30 or 40 tons uh, lying on a beach uh, is slowly crushing itself with its own body weight. Uh, and it's really important to end its suffering, as many of you will appreciate. So we also record stranded animals to help us find out more about the rarer species of animals that live out in our deeper waters. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So only actually last week, uh, we had a, a stranded uh, humpback whale, which uh, some of you may have heard about. And this whale washed up in near West Colla, uh, uh, near Skull in West Cork, a place where I have many of my ancestors are actually buried. Uh, and there we took some samples. And here we can have a look at um, the blubber sample, which is about three inches of blubber uh, that we removed from the whale. And it's really important. You may think, oh, it's strange. Why would you cut up parts of the whale? Well, for instance, by looking at the blubber, we can explore 
uh, what sort of uh, pollution or what sort of persistent contaminants have actually built up in the blubber layer of the whale. So all of these things like the skin and the blubber and the muscle give us really, really important information. And to help members of the public, you guys, citizen scientists, um, to help you identify species, we have lots of fantastic resources. Like we've just brought out Ireland's blubber book there, um, which came out only a couple of weeks ago. And this blubber book is available on our website, or it's actually being distributed free to all the primary schools in Ireland. So it's really important that we have this outreach, uh, you know, to, to help, you know, young people learn more about whales and dolphins. We also have our brand new guide to Ireland's ocean giants. So all of these wonderful resources and our books are available on our website for people who want to learn more about whales and dolphins and who want to contribute to our, to our recording schemes. So if you guys as members of the public want to report a sighting, you can simply log on to our website and click on there on the top left hand corner report a sighting or indeed if it's a stranded animal you, you want to report well then you would you would click on report a stranding and you you get asked information about the details that you've seen or indeed you can you you can simply take a photograph uh, and we will have a new recording app out hopefully at the end of March we're just testing it at the moment. So for all of you guys who are far more uh, tech savvy than we are, uh, we will have this amazing app that you can simply take out a phone and report a sighting or report a stranding to the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. Uh, and that will make the, strand, the reporting process uh, somewhat easier for, for members of the public. And this information that we get by in by encouraging members of the public to report their sightings and strandings. This helps us put dots on maps. It helps us learn more about where species are occurring around the coast and at what times of the year they're occurring as well. Is that Murray Hooley I see there? <laughs> Hi Murray. So, so here's just an example of harbour porpoise sightings uh, uh, every year, and you can see we generally have a peak there uh, during the high summer months. So our marine mammals, our cetaceans, if we include the likes of seals and otters, they're a really important group of animals. In fact, almost 50% or just over 50% or half of Ireland's mammals actually live in the sea. They don't live on land at all. So they are marine mammals are a really, really important group of uh, group of animals. And that's in an Irish context. And in a global context, we have almost one third of the world's species of whales and dolphins uh, are located in Irish waters. So we have a really high diversity of marine mammals and cetaceans of whales and dolphins in particular that live in Irish waters. So we are really, really fortunate. And they break down roughly into our toothed whales, which not surprisingly have teeth, uh, such as this sperm whale here, Moby Dick, if you like. Uh, and then we've got our baleen whales, or in the research community, we call these mystocetes. Uh, so these are whales that don't have teeth in their, in their mouth, but they have these baleen plates. And that's the picture on the image on the left is the, is the inside of the baleen plates. So they're filter feeders. And if you're a big whale, like a fin whale or a humpback whale, having teeth just wouldn't really work. Teeth would be useless for catching the very small fish like sprats and sand eels, or even smaller items uh, such as krill in the Atlantic. And to catch those, you really do need a filtering system. And that's exactly what baleen plates do. They enable the biggest whales like humpbacks and fin whales and blue whales to filter feed. So these are filter feeders. So if we have a quick look here, at the, what I call the usual suspects. And these are the species that we can see regularly in Irish waters. I, we've included the basking shark there because we, we kind of treat the basking shark as an honorary whale, if you like, uh, because they're big and they feed on plankton, just like they say some of the large whale species do. And it's really important for us to learn about these wonderful animals, perhaps not so many of them along the East Coast, uh, but lots of them occurring along the South Coast and the West Coast 
and, and the northwest coast. So this is a graphic here of our chart, which uh, thankfully was uh, was supported by BIM. Thank you, BIM, there based in Dunleary, uh, for giving us money to produce this chart. And you can see there, it's just interesting because you can see if you look on the right, you see all the dolphins and the porpoises and the killer whale. Their dorsal fins are in the center of their bodies. And that's the difference between a dolphin and a whale. Whereas if you look at the whales, starting with the fin whale, the humpback, the minke whale, their dorsal fins are more like further back, more like two thirds along the back. And that is actually the difference between a whale and a dolphin. So the dorsal fin on a whale is two thirds, but on a porpoise or a dolphin, it's halfway down the back. And some of you may have noticed, well, what's the killer whale doing there? It's a bit curious. Well, the killer whale is just an animal that's badly named, if you like. The common name, they should actually be called the killer dolphin because the killer whale is a member of the dolphin fa family. In fact, they're the largest member of the dolphin family, a wonderful species. If you, every time you see killer whales in Irish waters, it's a, it's a rare and very special, special moment. So I started, I, I left, I'm from County Wicklow originally, as you may have gathered from Greystones, where I spent a couple of years going out to places like uh, Brayhead and walking the coastline and going up the Hoth Head. And I never really got to see very much other than harbour porpoises. But then I moved down to West Cork uh, and everything changed dramatically. I started whale watching and pretty, you know, for a couple of years, I was kind of the only person out on the cliffs in all seasons whale watching. But very soon, it took a while, and people started realizing, crikey, there's amazing stuff to be seen uh, in our waters. And pretty soon, uh, I wasn't alone anymore. And we had hundreds of people coming to events like Whale Watch Ireland, uh, which during non-COVID times, uh, we run this amazing uh, All-Ireland Whale Watch event every year. And you can see there uh, some of the sites that we cover. Now, obviously, when COVID is over, it certainly won't happen this year. Uh, we'll return to Whale Watch Ireland, but I don't think it's going to happen until, until perhaps 2022. But it's a wonderful opportunity uh, for you guys, members of the public, Public, people who, are, who have a genuine interest in wh whales and dolphins to come and join us at a headland around the coastline. And here's just a sample. I think this is the top image there is Bray Head near the Pitch and Put. Uh, you've got Loop Head in County Clare, Schley Head in County Kerry. Just some of the many sites that we can carry out land-based whale watches uh, from around the Irish coastline. So let me give you some hints and some clues as to how you might go about whale watching. Well, the first thing is you need to plan ahead and you need to look at calm weather. So what you want is high pressure, which brings light winds, good visibility and calm seas, because calm seas are really important. Because if you end up out in a boat or sitting on a headland during stormy weather like that, well, you're just going to be you're not going to see anything. You're, you're going to under record whales and over record waves. So we're not wave watching, we're whale watching. So as well, if you were out in a boat, you'd be really seasick on a boat like that, or even on a big ship like that. So you need to watch very carefully your weather window. It's critically important. As well, you need to get upgrade and get some optics. And in particular, a good pair of binoculars is a minimum requirement. Now, I know you can go into Aldi or Lidl and buy a cheap pair of binoculars for $29.99. Forget about it. They just won't cut it. So you need to ask Santa Claus or whoever is, 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 uh, is going to get you your next best birthday present and ask them to invest in a good pair of binoculars. You'll notice this person in the middle here was a school teacher who came out in one of my courses. And at the end of that weekend, all she could say was, I didn't see anything really. She was a bit disappointed. And I told her that she slept for the whole weekend. Uh, so she kind of accepted the point. So to, to, to whale watch and to watch any sort of wildlife, you do need uh, to, to, you know, you need a level of diligence, a level of patience. Patience is uh, a really important virtue when you're not just interested in whale watching, but watching any sort of wildlife. And the other thing about, um, about binoculars is they tend to only work when they're up against your face. They tend not to work so well when they're shoved between your legs. Um, so, so optics are really, really important. The other thing is to watch the cues. And the best cue we have are seabirds, the likes of your seagulls, or your gannet here, because a lot of the time when we see whales and dolphins, they are associated with feeding seabirds. Because what's happening is 
the whales or dolphins or porpoises or maybe seals are chasing the fish up to the surface of the water and that brings the fish within range of the aerial predators. So if we keep watching the aerial predators, you're really making it significantly easier for you to have some wonderful encounters. So you can also nowadays go whale watching out in boats and I work quite closely with Ireland's leading and longest established whale watch operator Colin, Colin the famous Colin Barnes of Cork Whale Watch. Uh, so, uh, so there are now great opportunities for people who may feel mm, sitting on a headland for a couple of hours may not be my thing but I'd like to get out on a boat. Uh, maybe you've got good sea legs or you want to give it a go, in which case there are several really good operators, people like Colin Barnes who operates near Union Hall, you've got Baltimore uh, who have several whale watch operators, this is just a good example of some of the close up encounters we can have whale watching. Uh, Baltimore actually markets itself now almost as the whale watching capital of Ireland, rightly or wrongly. Uh, but there are whale watch operations now setting up out of places like Dingle and you can go out for, into the Shannon Estuary and see some of the bottlenose dolphins out of places like Kilrush or Carrigahold. So there are great opportunities now uh, more than ever for people to go out on boats using reputable whale watch operators or dolphin watch operators and have absolutely fantastic experiences. I, I know Murray there has whale watched around the world and I'm still trying to get Murray to come out whale watching uh, with us down in West Cork. So maybe Murray, it'll happen this summer for us, okay? Um, so, what, so obviously with all these people whale watching, we're getting lots of in interesting sightings data. And as you can see, when we started off 30 years ago, we got very, very few sightings. But actually last year, 2020, was our busiest year ever. We, we had over 2,000 sightings and they're still coming in. So it's great to have uh, that we can engage with so many members of the public, you guys, citizen scientists, who want to report their sightings to us. And most of these sightings are of common species in fairly usual circumstances, but we often get fantastic and, and mad sightings of common species in very unusual circumstances. And here's just a few of these pictures. Here's, um, here's a, a harbor porpoise, yes, in the River Ban in Coleraine, just at the back of the warehouse there in Dunn Stores. And what the heck is that animal doing uh, just outside Dunn Stores in the River Ban? Very, very strange indeed. This is the River Lee in Cork, and we've got a group of common dolphins. And you'd be amazed how often we get sightings of dolphins that swim up rivers, they, they move into estuaries like Cork Harbour or Waterford Harbour or even Dublin Bay. And we have recorded porpoises, dolphins, and even whales practically swimming in river systems. Here's an example here. This is, uh, somebody might recognize those iconic cranes. Well, Harland and Wolf and Belfast. So this is the Musgrave docks in Harland, out just at the back of the Harland and Wolf shipyard. And here's a young minke whale swimming in, in the inner harbor of Belfast, uh, Belfast docks. Absolutely crazy stuff. And it actually did get out. This animal did not strand. It swam out perfectly well. These were quite famous animals. These were the killer whales that came into Cork Harbour way back in 20, 2021, I think it was, the famous three killer whales in Cork Harbour. And they were seen by thousands of people uh, who thronged along Tivoli and Cork Harbour and Cove who watched these whales. And they just didn't come in and go out. These animals spent almost four months and on occasions at weekends, one weekend in particular, they swam right into the heart of Cork city centre. Imagine that, absolutely incredible and great to be able to record them. Sometimes we record very unusual species and you know we're all talking about COVID now, but there are bigger issues out there. One of them is climate change. Uh, but as a result of climate change, we're beginning to see strange things happening out there in our seas. Like this is the Arctic bowhead whale. Uh, turning up uh, off County Louth uh, back in 2016. So we had waited a long time for a new whale species in Ireland, but this was whale number 25 that actually turned up in the 25th year of the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. So it was actually a nice little, uh, a nice little surprise for us. Here we have a really strange looking animal. It's a pure white whale, closer up picture of Severick in County Antrim, a beluga whale 
what on earth is a beluga whale doing in Irish waters? I mean, these guys, these are the guys that get eaten by polar bears up in the Arctic Circle. And yet every couple of years, we do see beluga whales turning up in Irish waters. We had this little fellow, a couple of examples of bearded seals and hooded seals. Although we don't record seals, uh, we do record these unusual species. And of course, the largest member of the pinniped or seal family is the walrus. And my, my mother, hi Eileen, collected when I was away traveling, studying whales down in Argentina. She kept this newspaper clipping for me. And I'm really glad she did because it's the only picture of a walrus that I've ever seen from Ireland. But in actual fact, every three or four years, we, we validate records of walruses uh, in Irish waters. This was Clue Bay in County Mayo. And these are the, the seal with the enormous big tusks that are larger than big big bananas sticking out of their mouth. Again, uh, polar bears quite like to eat um, uh, walruses. So it's interesting. If we're seeing the food of polar bears, does that mean that the prey will, the predators will follow? Should we be walking along Kalini Strand in a couple of weeks time and, and look up the beach and see a big white bear with four legs running after us? I certainly hope not. Uh, but anyway, so just gonna look at, um, take an example here locally of, uh, an area around the old head of Kinsale, and we just extract the data and, uh, in, and we illustrate it in dots. So the blue dots are porpoises, the green dots are dolphin species, and the, the red dots are whale sightings. So you can see in that little small box, going back 20 years, we've got over 1500 sighting records of whales, dolphins, and porpoises in that one small area. And this is roughly how these sightings break down. So you can see in yellow there, the species we see most often is the harbour porpoise. And uh, the Irish name for the harbour porpoise is the, the Mukamara or the sea pig, but they have a beautiful name for the porpoise in the Kerry Gweltacht where they call them Ontohinoc, which translates as the wee fat fellow, which I think is far more charming. And the next species there is common dolphin. And after that, the most commonly seen whale at the moment is the fin whale. And of course, these figures are changing year on year. Some years, some species do better. Some years, species do worse. So um, so that's just to give you an idea. And we have a look at just a montage of the species that we see most of the time in, in Irish waters. So again, we are so fortunate to have this amazing species diversity uh, in, in Irish waters. And of course, these species are the inshore species, but when we go out into deeper waters uh, off the northwest, you've got the rock all, uh, the rock all trough there, uh, off the west coast of Porcupine Bank, or off the southwest coast down here, if you go out far enough out on a boat for, for 10, 12 hours, or what we usually do is we, we leave at midnight and we wake up at dawn on the Porcupine, porcupine Sea Bite, and out there, everything changes. We have a completely different diversity of species. So we see all these deep diving whales, we see beaked whales, uh, and we see the likes of these sperm whales here that are photographed quite regularly by the CASA unit. They're the, uh, they're the, the maritime squadron, if you like, that are linked to the Irish Defence Forces. Uh, and they're flying over Irish, or what we call our EEZ, which is our exclusive economic zone which extends out 200 miles offshore. So in actual fact, when we think of a map of Ireland, about one tenth of Ireland is the land area of Ireland. The vast majority of Ireland, at least nine tenths of Ireland is actually under sea and really is under underexplored. So we have these species of deep diving whales that live in our very, very deep waters. And we know very, very little about these mysterious and deep diving whales. Some of these whales can dive to incredible depths of two and even 3000 meters. That's three kilometers depth. And they can dive for lengths of time of one hour, two hours. Some researchers think the Cuvier's beaked whale can even dive for almost three hours. You imagine trying to hold your breath for 30 seconds, let alone for three hours, amazing. We've also got chances to see the planet's largest whale, the mighty blue whale out in these waters. And I've been privileged enough to see blue whales uh, 
never in Irish waters, but very, very close to Irish waters. We've seen blue whales on our research expeditions uh, to, you know, to the likes of uh, Iceland, and I've seen blue whales in, in Baja, Southern California. They are an amazing, amazing animal. And just to illustrate how big a blue whale is, I've put in this picture, which is the jaw bones, the lower jaw bones of a blue whale. And this picture is taken in a public park in the Netherlands. And that guy on the bicycle, He's a Dutch man. And one thing we know about Dutch men is they're quite tall. So he is over two meters long. So you can imagine how big the jawbone is. That jawbone is probably four times larger than that Dutch man. So that jawbone alone, which supports the head and the skull, could quite easily be 24, 25 feet long. Uh, and a, an amazing example of just how big blue whales are. And of course, in the old days, those jawbones would form people in period residence or in posh houses, big, big old houses would quite often, if a whale stranded locally, they would cut out the local jawbones and they would form an arch, which was a real status symbol. Look at us where we've lots of money and we have a whale arch as the grand entrance to our home. Uh, and I've seen one of those remaining uh, whale arches in Donegal and the creamery truck used to come into the farm and used to drive under the whale arch of what was probably a fin whale. So an amazing thing to see. I'll just talk a little bit about some of the research work of the IWDG, um, especially work that's been carried out at sea. And sometimes we need to take samples. You saw a picture at the start of me taking a sample from a dead whale down here near Skull last week but often we need to take samples from living whales. So, you know, it's a, so the only way we can do that uh, at the moment anyway, is by shooting the whale just with a crossbow and taking a small little piece of skin through the hollow tip of that. The whale doesn't even know that it's been struck by this dart. You see an example there of the dart striking the whale and it's taking a little piece of skin and that piece of skin within that piece of skin we can get genetics, we can get DNA, uh, we, can get, we can look at the pollutant contaminants in the whale, uh, and we can look at things like stable isotope analysis, which I don't even understand. Very clever people looking out, looking out for all of this information, way above my pay scale. But that's some of the research we're doing. And of course, whales live in a world of sound. So they're incredibly sentient, intelligent mammals. And we as a species, we live in a world, a very visual world. So for us, our primary sense is probably sight. And if you're a whale and you spend most of your life down in the depths where there's no sunlight can penetrate, well, your eyesight is pretty useless. So you need sound. So for us to study whales using acoustics is actually a very clever way, or it's the smarter way to study these whales in all seasons. And we do that using equipment like hydrophones, which is an underwater microphone that we can drop on the seabed and it listens in on the private lives of whales. And of course, there's many advantages in using sound because we don't need good weather. These acoustics can be dropped to the seabed and they can be left there recording irrespective as to whether it's Christmas Day or St. Patrick's Day or it's your birthday, they're just recording independently. And then every three or six months, we can pop the device up, it comes to the surface and we can download that data, which gives us an awful lot of wonderful information about the presence and the absence of these whales in our local waters. We're also out there doing photo identification, which is just a fancy way of saying, we're basically taking pictures but we're not interested in pretty pictures of whales. We have loads of them. We're interested in photographs of whales and dolphins that help us tell a story. So essentially that's what we do, we're storytellers. And we can tell, so here's a pretty picture of dolphins. Again, it doesn't tell us anything, but if you get photographs of their dorsal fins on the left, it gives us an identity in each whale. Well, now we recognize these, dolphins, sorry, these bottlenose dolphins as individuals. And this data we can use to track and to monitor these whales or dolphins in this case, as they return year after year. And of course, with the likes of bottlenose dolphins, they're resident in lots of places. So they live here year round. Uh, we're doing the same thing with fin whales. And a project I'm particularly involved in is the Irish humpback whale catalog, where we now have 
109 individual humpback whales and they all tell a story because we can recognize them as individuals returning year after year and in some cases decade after decade we're now into the third decade of some of the earlier animals up here on the left uh, who go back to the late 1990s um, and we're still seeing some of these individuals returning so it's telling us that our waters are very very important for these animals that these just are not random chance encounters, that these animals are seeking out Irish waters year after year. And they are returning in, in greater numbers. So it's great, it's a, it's a fantastic good news conservation story at a time when we tend to hear just so much negativity uh, about our oceans and about whales and dolphins. And uh, there's nothing quite like seeing something like humpback whales with the beautiful Kerry Mountains. You've got the three sisters there, Count Shabale, Shabale Head in the background, absolutely gorgeous with the West Cork, or in this case, the Kerry, the, the Kerry backdrop, I always think. The, the beautiful landscape in Kerry, it's wasted on the Kerry men. Uh, I hope there's nobody from Kerry listening in here today. But it's beautiful. Kerry is one of the best places uh, to see these returning humpback whales. And they should be starting to return, hopefully, late March, even early April. So it's only a short while to go before we're going to have these giants returning to our waters. And of course, with these photographs, we're telling not just the story about them here when they're in Ireland, but also we're starting to put together this mosaic um, it's a bit like the story of whales is a large jigsaw puzzle with not even a hundred pieces. It's with a thousand pieces. Some people would say 10,000 pieces. And at the moment, we probably have the first 20 pieces of that jigsaw puzzle in place. But we are slowly starting to put together, to build that bigger picture about how these humpback whales are using Irish waters. So here on the top right, you've got the small humpback whale that was photographed in September 2007. And a couple of months earlier, it was actually off Texel Island in the Netherlands in May. And it was seen once here and then about two and a half months later, it turned up back off the Dutch coast the same year. Amazing. And then it disappeared for five years when our colleagues in northern Norway photographed the humpback whale and they matched it with our catalogue as the same humpback whale. Uh, so it's amazing. So we're starting to make these links. And here it is here, number seven on the Irish catalogue feeding in the fjords on nor in northern Norway, way up in the Arctic Circle. This is 300 kilometers inside the Arctic Circle, and it's feeding with killer whales in this fjord. Thankfully, those killer whales aren't meat eaters. They're, they're herring. They're small fish, small fish feeders. So the humpback whale is aware of this and is completely safe feeding with these killer whales. So you can have a look here, you just get a rough outline of just how far we know this humpback whale has traveled from Ireland to the Netherlands, all the way up the Norwegian Sea, way up inside the Arctic Circle. And we're also now starting to match these animals to their breeding grounds, to where they're actually having their young. So we've already got three matches down here with the Cape Verdes of West Africa, which is amazing because now we know where a cohort of these humpback whales are being born. So that's really important from a conservation perspective, because if you want to protect and conserve a species, the first question is, well, which population or which stock are we talking about and where are they born? Because it's where any species, humans included, it's where we're born that we are at the most vulnerable. So it's critical to find out where they're born. So we don't just spend our time out on boats down in the tropics looking for Irish humpback whales because we want a suntan. We need to learn where the whales that are visiting Irish waters are born so we can ensure the population continues to, tr to thrive. And it's great because now we have access to the, uh, to the boat, which was owned many years ago by the Hahi family. Charlie Hahi was a former uh, Taoiseach or Prime Minister, and his family uh, donated the Celtic mist to the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. And we now use this for humpback whale and fin whale work and expeditions. The most recent expedition we had was back in 2018, where with the support of Inish, a small company in Wicklow on the foothills of the Sugarloaf Mountain, gave us a pile of money and said, go and do some brilliant research. And we said, we're going to Iceland on our boat, the Celtic Mist. So we sailed up from Dublin, up along Donegal, where we jumped out from Maharorty in northwest Donegal, and we took a seven day transit to Reykjavik, the capital of Iceland, and then we circumnavigated Iceland, 
got quite seasick in places, but we had some amazing encounters on the way. And we, we found some Kerry humpback whales, some of the Irish cohort of humpback whales up inside the Arctic Circle feeding up here in Northern Iceland. So it was a great, very successful expedition. And this humpback whale in the front here of this picture was a whale that we had seen the previous summer off uh, Clotherhead near on the Schleyhead Peninsula near Dingle. So amazing to travel so far north into the Arctic Circle and find uh, Kerry humpback whales up, up there. And here we are. Oh, Iceland's a great place, guys. If you ever get an opportunity, go to Iceland. You need to do a bit of saving. It's quite an expensive country to visit uh, for a few months. But anyway, it's a wonderful place. And seeing it on our research boat, it's such, such, such a privilege. So I'm just going to finish up on uh, some of the conservation threats that we that that our whales faced. And of course, in the old days, the biggest threat faced by our whales uh, was whaling. Because, yeah, we used to kill whales and we had a couple of whaling stations in Ireland. Most of them, they were Norwegian owned, but one was off the Inishkays in County Mayo. And there was another one then uh, in uh, near in Donegal Bay, uh, in our, the Aranmore whaling station based in Donegal Bay. So Ireland itself uh, has a history. Uh, our hands are kind of, if you like, dipped in the blood of whales, but it's going back a long time. Uh, some of our nearest neighbours still hunt whales. We, we certainly wish they wouldn't, uh, but because in this day and age, there really is very little argument for killing whales, uh, especially to eat them. Our supermarkets are full of food. We honestly don't need to kill uh, whales to eat them anymore. So if you're out there listening and you're from Norway or Iceland or even the Faroes, please stop killing whales. Uh, there is absolutely no need to kill them in this day and age. And of course, a, a living whale uh, for people like in Iceland and Norway is worth an awful lot more to their economies through whale watching, which is one of the reasons why the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group actively supports commercial whale watching, because it's non-invasive, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't kill whales, it might still disturb whales, but it doesn't kill them, uh, and that's a, big, that's a big plus. Of course, there are lots of different ways of killing whales, and you can starve them to death, so we are very concerned about uh, these big trawlers, and I must say, these big trawlers are all Irish owned. We are doing a lot of this damage to our own fisheries ourselves. A lot of people like to blame the big Danish and the Dutch and the German trawlers. Uh, you know what, we are doing the worst damage to our own fisheries ourselves, all locally owned boats that are just taking way too much of the wrong fish out of our seas. The very fish uh, that our big whales need to feed on as well. And it's not just the whales, it's dolphins, it's seals, it's sharks, it's seabirds. So the whole marine ecosystem can be badly affected by our targeting, especially the small fish. These are the forage fish that we don't particularly want to eat, but these fish are being landed in vast sums so that they can be processed for fish meal, so that they can feed caged salmon. Uh, so artificially bred salmon in fish farms in Spain uh, is where a lot of this fish is going to. So it's just wrong on every level and, and really the Irish government needs to seriously stop this. And this is something that the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group is, is lobbying. Occasionally, dolphins get caught in fishing nets and unfortunately when they do, they drown. And this is something that we call bycatch. It's unfortunate, it's not intentional, it's completely accidental, uh, but it's something uh, that, is, that is very regrettable. And a lot of the time, we, we've noticed as we take pictures of whales, some of our whales actually are getting caught uh, in, in fishing gear, but they're surviving. So you can see this was a whale that we photographed over the summer last year. And the last photograph that my colleague Nick Massett got of this whale, you can see there, there's lots of marks on it and there's little blood marks there on the whale. So this is a humpback whale that got caught in fishing gear and thankfully managed to get out of the fishing gear, but it did actually get slightly injured in the process. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes the whales aren't so lucky. Um, and it is possible that that humpback whale that I was with last week in Rolling Water Bay also may well have got caught in, in, in fishing gear. But anyway, the other, one of the other sources of pollution that we're most concerned with is noise pollution. And of course, earlier I talked about these whales being acoustic mammals that live in a world of sound. And for them, any ship, even a small whale watching boat, has the potential to create noise and of course whales are living 
in increasingly noisy ocean environment. And this is something that shipping companies, the likes of this one here, are very concerned with reducing their noise. So reducing the level of, uh, of anthropogenic or man-made noise that is out there uh, in the ocean. It's really important because if our oceans get too noisy, the whales won't be able to do all the things they use sound for, such as migrating, such as socializing. And they also use whales to find and to catch their food. So for them, if you actually take a whale and make the ocean so noisy, it's, it's almost like putting a blindfold on us in the middle of Grafton Street or the, the middle of the M50 and saying to that whale, make, you know, or saying to us, make your way home. It's going to be extremely difficult without colliding into a car. So for them, for whales and dolphins, sound and acoustics are really important. So when we think of pollution, yes, plastics is a problem, but a far greater problem is noise pollution. Um, so I'm just kind of, kind of finishing up now. I think I'm bang on 40 minutes, which isn't bad timing. But also, if you're ever out in a boat and you're out in the boat with a skipper who's in the company of whales, you do need to take care to be intelligent about how you operate. Don't get too close to the whale because sometimes whales leap out of the water and sometimes they might land on your boat. So if you're in the presence of a whale, uh, just make sure you, you respect the guidelines which are to keep where possible, a safe distance of 100 meters and don't cross the whale's path. And especially if you've got a young whale like this one, because your boat will come out an awful lot worse than the whale will. I'm not sure where those squiggles have come from. That must have been me. But anyway, somebody is writing on my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> um, but anyway, so how can you guys get involved? If you'd like to support the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, um, you can become members of the Whale and Dolphin Group. We're a charity. We have a membership base of hundreds of people who are passionate about whales and dolphins. We're not all hard-nosed scientists. Many of us are just interested amateurs. I'm, an inter I'm a whale watcher myself. I don't have a science background per se. Uh, so I just love sitting out in the clifftop or out in the boat, finding whales and observing them and trying to learn more about them so we can protect these whales uh, for this next generation coming up and your children and your grandchildren. So I think just a huge thanks to the guys, to the team and as I am uh, for inviting us here. I hope you've all learned something. Uh, and, you know, um, yeah, you know, thanks to, to, to Brendan, to Nicola and to Sean. Uh, and uh, yeah, if there's any questions, um, I will do my best to, to answer them. Well, Borica, when's the best time to see some whales in, from Brayhead? From Brayhead, well, I would say probably for Brayhead, probably in the summer months when we've had sightings last July and August of minke whales uh, during the months of July or August. Again, it's more about the weather, Murray. So you need to look carefully at the weather. So uh, if you went on a, just because I've said July or August, doesn't mean you're gonna see them, especially if the weather is bad. So you need really, really nice calm weather and go out to say um, the vantage point up there beside the, 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 the pitch and put golf club. Uh, uh, but you, you will need to put in a lot of work. Murray, you're gonna need to come down to West Cork where I can almost guarantee that you'll see whales. Uh, but it, you know, so yeah. So you need an element of luck, you need good weather, and you need good a good pair of binoculars. But I would say July, August, even September, you have at least a chance. But you know what? Your best species to see off Brayhead would be the harbour porpoise. Because we would see harbour porpoises off Brayhead you know, in good weather, about 70, 80% of the time we go up to that point. And of course, the harbour porpoise is a whale. It's just a very small whale with teeth. Thank you. Okay. I've obviously covered everything. How far can they talk uh, to each other? Well, wow, that's a great question. Um, I, I was working with researchers who had a conversation. Uh, with, uh, they were studying fin whales up in Greenland, which is way up in the Arctic Circle. And they were, we were at a conference and they started talking to other researchers who were studying fin whales in the Azores, which are between, say, Portugal and North Africa. There's a distance of about two and a half, three thousand kilometers between the Azores and Greenland. 
And as the conversation went on, they were comparing, they were talking about the research and they realized that they were both doing acoustic research on the same space, species, fin whales, at the same time. And all of a sudden the researchers started getting more interested because they recognized that they had both taken recordings of fin whales at the same time on the same day, albeit two and a half thousand kilometers away. And then they got intrigued. They, they wondered, if they, they, they gave their data to mathematicians and asked them to look at the probability of these whales talking to each other. And, and they kept playing back the sounds, the recordings, and the mathematicians, the statisticians came back and said, it is almost 100% certainty. And they could tell by the calls going out from the, hump, from the fin whales in Greenland, and then seconds later, there was a reply from the fin whales in the Azores. Wow. And they that was repeated <clears throat> over a number of hours. So we know that there are humpback whales in the tropics now capable of having conversations with, hump, with fin whales up in the Arctic Circle. So these whales can communicate across entire oceans. So that's why sound and communication is so critical for these whales. And that's why noisy oceans are not good oceans for these whales. That's incredible on the poor eggs, so they can talk far away. I think so. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Hi. Hello, Larry here. Hi. Uh, Hi, this thing is very good. It's very interesting because I'm always very fascinated with whales and that. And you see, I, ne I never see whales before, but I did see the orca whale now, all right. I saw them in Florida a long time ago because I saw them in SeaWorld and I know they were kept cavity and I know it's very wrong how it works and that, but I'm always very fascinated with orca whales. I don't know why, but I always had them. I, it's so strange because, but, where are they from? from? Are, are they from? Do, can, do they, are, they, are there any orca whales in Ireland? Yep, I showed you one of the images there from Cork Harbour. But uh, listen, Florian, I, I'm intrigued. As a, as a much younger guy, I travelled around the world to work with killer whales in British Columbia in, uh, and in, down in Patagonia and Argentina. So I listen, I, I'm such a killer whale uh, sort of uh, not if you like that i traveled around the world my, my my mother probably thought i was crazy at the time uh but they are um the most amazing species uh of of, of my whale. mother and, likes them yeah my mother fact, likes them but uh, sometimes now they do look a bit scary don't they do you think they look a bit scary a small bit the way I, they look. and sometimes yeah. they do look a bit cross all right but they're very harmless whales they don't harm people do they no, they're, well, they're harmless for people, but of course, they're, they're top predators. So the killer whale in the ocean is like the tiger in the, is like a tiger in the jungle or the forest, or like the wolves uh, out in the out in the plains. They're they're our top predators, and unfortunately, you cannot be a top predator without killing things. Uh, so so we look at these animals in one way, and we think they're kind of cute and cuddly, and then we look at them another way, and you got to remind yourselves that they are predators they are potentially dangerous like any predator but there, there are, are actually no cases of killer whales attacking people in the wild now in mm. captivity there yeah. are lots of cases of killer whales mm -hmm. even killing people in, in, in these concrete tanks so again Florin, well done for pointing it out keeping whales and dolphins in concrete tanks for our entertainment is wrong there is there's it's actually Exactly, and it's great if you're an advocacy to do advocacy for whales as well, and that's brilliant, you know. So, like, they have a right to have their own home, and that because see, I, I looked them up and all, and all different whales, as well, like dolphins are lovely, and beluga whales, my god, are very nice. Beluga whales are originally from Sweden, and they? they're so white, aren't they? And they're very, they're such a beautiful type of creatures, as well, aren't they? And, yeah. Well, they're from the Arctic, sir. They're, they're from wherever you get pack ice up on the, the North Pole or up in the Arctic region. That's where you got belugas. And, and like all, all land mammals uh, mm -hmm. up in the Arctic area, they're, they're, of course, they've evolved to being white in colour because, of course, that, that protects them from attack by the other 
key predator up there, which is, of course, the polar bear. Uh, but every five or six years, we get a beluga whale record from Ireland. So it is crazy to think that a whale like the white whale or the beluga whale that has been adopted to life in the Arctic occasionally turns up in Irish waters. So we're always wondering, do they ever get back? And I don't think they do. They're so far from home. I think it's very unlikely that they'd ever get back. It would be nice to think that they could. And the blue whales are very powerful as well. Blue whales are very powerful as well. For but, sure. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for that because I'm very oh, delighted. Nice thank to you. Talk. Okay, fine. Thank you. And there's just a question there in the chat box as well, uh, just asking uh, how much can humpback whales eat every day? Oh, a healthy adult humpback whale could easily eat uh, up to 2,000 2, pounds of food in a day. Uh, yeah. So if they can eat, it's thought they can eat about one one thirtieth of their body weight. So like if you were a humpback whale, uh, you know, that, that weighed 15 or 20 tons, you could quite easily weigh you know, uh, eat, consume almost a ton of food uh, in a day. And the thing about whales is when they're feeding, they, they, they don't feed for the whole year. So when they come to Ireland um, in the next couple of weeks, they're going to stay here because at our latitudes, they're feeding. But then when they go back down to the tropics, down to the breeding areas to have young, there's no whale food down there. So for almost three or four months, they are in a place where they are there's no food so that's why when they're here they really need to make a while the sun shines if you like um, and by the time they return from the tropical areas where there's no whale food they've lost almost one third of their body weight so when they get here they're hungry they're mm. starving and they need to spend the next three four five months gorging themselves because after periods of plenty there's periods when, when the larder is quite empty wow well, yeah um, I think so. Uh, Leah wants to ask a question. Leah? Um, would you mind reminding me um, why are killer whales called killer whales if they're in the dolphin family? That's a really good question because they've been named quite badly. Uh, it's what we call a misnomer. They should never, they should actually, but the reason why they, they were called killer whales in answer to your question is simply that the old whalers who used to kill whales in some parts of the world, like down in Southern Australia, used to find that killer whales would, were, and they just thought they were big dolphins basically, which, which they're right, they are big dolphins but they used to swim into the bay and help round up, say, the humpback whales or the right whales. So the killer whales used to call them, or the, the, the old whalers, the human whalers, used to call them whale killers. And over the centuries, that whale killers has just got reversed around the killer whales. Uh, but it, it's, it is a bad name. So they should be called, if anything, killer dolphins because they are, they are dolphins, just very big dolphins. So killer whales is whale killers that just over the years has got sw switched around. Of course, you can call them orcas if you like. And some people prefer to use the word orca because uh, it may not be quite as offensive. Uh, I happen to like killer whales. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, here we go. We have another one. Uh, do humpback whales have any natural predators? Uh, probably killer whales. Uh, probably every, killer whales. <laughs> uh, every, this conversation keeps coming back to killer yeah. whales, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, killer whales. But actually, you know, it's really only a healthy adult humpback whale really has very little to fear from a killer whale. It tends to be calves. So if, if you're... Um, and that's probably why they go down to these tropical areas like the Cape Verge or the Caribbean to have their young, because there'll be much fewer killer whales down there. Of course, there's big sharks and stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if you're a young humpback whale, uh, you'd have to say uh, um, killer whales would be the biggest threat. But to be honest, if you're a mature humpback whale in, in, in good and adult size and good health, you probably have nothing to fear from killer whales. They would give that big tail on a humpback whale a wide berth. Uh, I don't think there's any more questions unless anyone wants to ch chip in there with a the last question. We good? It's great. So thank you so much uh, for that, Padre. That was really very, very, very interesting. Uh, just to remind you everyone as well, it will be available on uh, YouTube uh, probably from later on today. So if you have any friends or family that missed it, or if you guys want to rewatch, uh, you're more than welcome to. It'll be available on the As I Am YouTube page. So big thank you, Padraig, and uh, we might leave it there. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us again. Bye.